so yeah so that's 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 all the housekeeping slides we have for tonight uh our first our first session is introduction to cloud data warehousing with snowflake with asanka and makura uh asanka all yours yeah. Uh, let me share screen. Uh, first of all, like I have a little of technical issues, like I pretty much can't see who's in the uh, sessions, and it just shows me like I'm the only person doing the sessions in the uh, teams. So if you have any questions, like I hopefully uh, you will let me know because I can't see any chat or anything right now. Yeah, sure. I uh, will yeah. help you. Uh, I will help moderate uh, the questions for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So let me share the screens and. Uh, I uh, hope everyone can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah cool. So uh, first of all, uh, thank you for letting me do the sessions and I'm really uh, grateful to be in here. It's a bit uh, late in here. It's actually uh, 12 a.m. in New Zealand. Cool. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today is basically Snowflakes and when I talk about snowflakes, I'm going to cover around before directly jump into the snowflake. I want to cover about cloud data warehousing, how snowflake is placed inside the cloud data warehousing platform. Brief introduction to myself. I'm Asanka Padma Kumar. I'm a BI consultant in a company called Curious in and work in New Zealand, Auckland based. I've been working related to data and BI technologies, especially the data warehousing, almost 10 years now. I'm a regular speaker of data related events because data is, is my passion in a way. So whenever I have time, I try to write stuff about the data, the Power BI, data factory, data engineering stuff in my blog. So you please do have a look and you can connect me via the LinkedIn so we can communicate about the data related technologies and you can follow me the Twitter as well. Let's quickly jump into to this main topic, the data warehousing. I think this is like pretty much everyone know what is a data warehouse still, but I want to get a starting point to this session. So what is a data warehouse? Data warehouse like a warehouse is basically you have stuff, whatever the stuff you put in the warehouse, but it's not just you put in the stuff you actually do some kind of a, you do put some kind of order to do some kind of a process to store something in a warehouse. So same as in the uh, data warehouse, you will have lots of data coming from multiple systems and then you will put a order. You will put a process when you store that data in the data warehouse. So let's take an example for a, a normal organization even a smallest organization nowadays they use multiple systems to do their operations like in this example we have accounting systems you and you have a sales system maybe post system or something then you have your uh, erp system or supplier information supplier data and when you have multiple employees you will get the hr system to your organization etc 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 so which means that to govern a one organization, you will need a lot of uh, services, applications, and each applications develop data. And then when you want to analyze your organization as a whole, what you do is like you want to bring all those data into one place and then you do analytics. You do reporting, dashboarding, maybe data science stuff. So for all of those things, the input is data warehouse. So if you take the characteristic of a data warehouse, it's a central data repository and it's organized and it's integrated with multiple source systems and most importantly, it's a read optimized because you want to read the data rather than you frequently write. So this is OL, OLAP scenario, right? Not all OLTP scenario and you do reporting and analysis. The one thing I want to emphasize again is when it comes to data warehousing, when it comes to hardware of the data warehouse, we talked about SMP data warehousing platforms and MPP data, MPP data warehouse platform. What is SMP and MPP? Let's talk about that. So the SMP or symmetric multiprocessing, which means that when it comes to hardware, so whatever your data house, at the end it will go to a server. 
right? So when it comes to the SMP, your server will have multiple CPUs and all those CPUs will share same OS, same memory, same hard disk, same network connection. So the best example of a SMP is a normal server or your CPU, your personal machine, right? Because you have multiple cores. When we talk about nowadays servers, you talked about like eight core servers, 16 core, 32, 64 cores, so, but you talked about cores, but all those cores have a same memory. So let's take an example like 64 core server, Windows server, and it has like maybe 120 GB RAM and maybe five terabyte hard disk, but all those 64 cores will share same memory, same disk drive. So we call this architecture shared everything architecture or sometimes we refer as a shared disk architecture. So when you want to improve the performance, remember why we talked about these servers is like when it's come to the data volume of the, the, the the data volume per data warehouse, that's a bigger system in the organization because you bring data from all the all the uh, source systems. So the, your data warehouse tend to be huge and you would bigger servers. So it, we are always talking about large servers when it's come to data warehouse. So when you have a performance issue in your data warehouse server, what you do is like in SMP servers, you scale up, which means that you increase the CPU you increase the memory, you increase the hard disk, same server, but you increase the configuration. And SMP uh, data warehouse, SMP configurations have high concurrency, and but after a certain level, you cannot scale up. Like after, let's say that you have 64 core server, and then you want to improve the performance, you have to go for 128 cores, and that is expensive. So after a certain level, so going from 8 core to 16 core is quite OK, but after a certain level, the higher you go, it becomes more expensive to improve or to expand your server capacity and come to SMP. The next option is the one we talked about massively parallel processing with the MPP architecture. So the MPP architecture is different. You have multiple processors and each processor has its own memories and own disk. So we call it shared nothing architecture, which means that you have nodes, node based architecture. Each node has its own CPU, own memory, own disk, and each disk has a portion of your data or the portion of your data warehouse to process. And all those nodes are connected using high speed internet. And then what happens is each node process your data and that data is shared among your nodes. So it's distributed processing architecture. So in case when you want to improve the performance, you can scale up as well as you can scale out, which means that you need to add more node to your cluster, distributed cluster. Compared to the uh, SMP, after a certain level, or the, when you want to improve for higher performance, it's cheaper because going from 64 cores to from 1 to 8 core to the 62 core, 64 core is doubling your core. You can add more nodes, cheaper nodes to your cluster, which is cheaper after a certain level. But the problem is like when it comes to MPP, you always have to remember it comes with its own issues, which is low concurrency because your data is distributed among multiple nodes and processing happens distributedly. And if people are trying to get the data, it has to go for all those nodes and you have to, you know, this high speed internet is the bottleneck when it's come to the concurrency. Cool. Now, the decision about whether we want to go to the SMP or MPP. So the SMP is good for the small to medium data sets. If you perform many small read and write operations frequently, SMP is, is ideal and if you want to do multiple row by row operations, SMP is the ideal for your data warehousing. Whereas if you have big data analytics, batch oriented web uh, workloads, you do the complex data processing. I'm talking about terabytes of data in your data warehouse. You should consider go for the MPP. So that's the decision you have to make whether I'm going to go to SMP data warehouse solution or the MPP data warehouse solution. When it comes to MPP data warehouse solutions, because this is a distributed architecture, it's really difficult for, it's, it's not impossible, but it's really difficult for a 
maintain an on-premise MPP solution. Because of that, all the major cloud vendors like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, they have come up with uh, their own MPP data warehouse solutions. They give you a data warehouse as a service. But if you can see that Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and within that, there's a big another player comes to the play, which you are not heard of, but giving a good, you know, fight against these big players called Snowflake. So that is what I'm going to cover today. What Snowflake brings to the MPP data warehouse solution. OK, before that, let's talk about why people go for a cloud data warehousing. Why not on premise? So we'll go for a one by one characteristic we want from the data warehouse solution. First one, scalability. So if you go for the cloud data warehouse, you have a high scalability. You can scale up, scale out based on your requirement, based on your workload. You just go to the portal. You can add more nodes. You can increase the configuration of your field. You can do that. But on premises is time consuming and resource consuming to improve or change the scalability of your data warehouse. Again, go to the availability. You have the high availability to the cloud. They guarantee you the high availability, but when come to the on-premises, it's all depend on your hardware or software qualities. And if you want to perform a disaster recovery, it's again an expensive operation. You need to have more hardware, more software to do that. Security-wise, cloud data warehouse solutions, high secure environment, and in you have it, it is secured because it's in your organizations, but again, it's depend on the competence of your, of your internal IT teams, how good they are in when come to handling the security on your internet in, in your organizations. Performance wise, cloud data warehouse solutions depend on selecting service is again highly dependent and but in general is give you good performance because that's their business. In on promise, you can achieve a high performance, but again, depend on how good your hardware is. Cost, when you go to the cloud data warehouse solution, no capex, it's mostly pay as you go, you can select it, no maintenance cost. If you want to implement a data warehouse, you go there cloud, spin up your services, and you start using it. And whereas if you go for on-premises, you have to do a significant investment for that. You need to, train your organization people, you need to buy the hardware, you need to buy the software, and you have to spend a lot before you go to the solution. Maintainability point of view, you don't need to maintain a cloud data warehouse solutions because most of these are, are like, basically these are like past services, right? So you can just spin up and you can start using it, whereas if you have your data warehouse solution on premises, you have to continuously monitor, you have to continuously improve the performance, you have to continuously support your data warehouse solution on premise. So that's why people go for a cloud data warehousing. Okay, the main topic of today, Snowflake. So what is Snowflake? Snowflake is a data warehouse as a service, it's purely DW as a service. Most importantly, it's built from the scratch. So if you're familiar with the Microsoft Synapse, the other, uh, other technology data warehouse competitors, most of these technologies are actually coming from a previous technologies and you know improvement. If you go for Synapse, it started as a parallel data warehouse and it's come to the uh, Azure SQL data warehouse, Gen 1 and Gen 2, now it's Synapse. But Snowflake is actually built from the scratch for the data warehousing purpose. And it gives you a three editions, standard, enterprise, and business critical. And if you have very secure requirements, where you can have a virtual private Snowflake as well. Like if you have a government requirement, so you have a restricted security info, is very concerned for you, you can have your own private Snowflake, which is not connected to the public Snowflake entities, which is owned. And the most important thing is, I think, is Snowflake is cloud agnostic, which means that you can have Snowflake data warehouse in Azure if you're already in Azure. And if you are already in AWS, you can have your Snowflake in AWS. Or if you are already using Google Cloud, you can use Snowflake in Google Cloud as well. So it's, it doesn't matter what your cloud platform right now is, 
you can still use Snowflakes. That's really cool. And just like other, most of the other data warehouse pass services, you can go for the pay as you go on demand, or you can go for the capacity based pricing. So that's a pretty much a high level of Snowflakes as a data warehouse service. If you go for the store, history of the Snowflakes, they founded the company in 2012, just, and then they went on public with Snowflakes on Amazon in 2014 and 2018, they announced that they have Snowflakes in Azure and 2019, they announced Snowflakes in Google Cloud. And by 2020, they have like 3,400 plus customers using Snowflakes and 12.5 billion USDs as of now. So you can see that they are this is pretty new to the actually the game. The data warehousing solution provider Snowflakes is new, but it is improving massively because the reason is the amount of uh, flexibilities it gives and the performance and the, the competition, the features it gives to the uh, data warehousing platform. So it's new, but it has a huge future and everyone is talking about Snowflakes nowadays. And you can see that you can see that from the Gartner Magic Quadrant in 2019. I don't have 2020's information, but in 2019 information, it is among the big players as of now. Like, so you can see Oracle, Microsoft, Amazon, SAP, Teradata, Google, IBM. These are big players in the data and analytics, but Snowflake is no less is, is in the leader in after a couple of years. Availability wise. You are lucky. I think uh, you are in like if you go for a uh, so the yellow one represents the AWS cloud availability. So Singapore is there when it comes to AWS. Singapore is there when it comes to the Azure. But right now, I think Google Cloud only supported in uh, US and Europe pretty sure it will be there in the uh, Singapore region as well. So which means that if you are using AWS and Azure, you can use Snowflake in Singapore. And these are the available other available regions when it's come to the Snowflake as a service to you, the data center wise. Cool. Well, let's talk about the architecture. That's the cool thing about Snowflake. So Snowflake is actually a hybrid approach. It's a shared nothing architecture combined with the shared disk architecture. So it comes with three layers. So it's talked about we have the database storage layer, we have a query processing storage layer, and the cloud service. So if you go for the bottom, you have unlimited cheap storage. So your storage is costed separately. You can have unlimited of data inside and it's cheap. And then you have this next layer, MPP, Compute engine, we call it virtual warehousing. You have uh, virtual warehouses which do the computation. You have a data separately, you have processing separately, and on top of that, Snowflakes is handling pretty much everything from authentications, authorizations, infrastructure managers, optimizations, metadata management, security. So you don't have to pretty much do anything. You just dump your data, you just run your query, and Snowflakes handles the pretty much everything for you. It's not like any other cloud DW solutions, right? The how they handle the data is internally, so you will not see how the data is stored inside the Snowflakes. It's internally optimized and it's highly compressed. It's basically they use a columnar data storage, and which means that you have a high compressed data, but you will not see how the data is stored in the Snowflakes. So just like you use your SQL Server, you have a table, you can use normal NC SQL to write the queries and do the processing using Snowflakes. Cool, so how does it happen is like you have data and your data is broken into the virtual warehouses and push the portions of your data to the virtual warehouses and they do the processing and serve you the results. It's a distributed processing, but data is sit separately in the Snowflakes. Now let's talk about 
virtual warehouses. So the virtual warehouses is just like, how do you select the virtual warehouses? It's just like you have you select your T-shirt. So you have sizes from extra small to 4X large. So extra small has a one node, whereas the 4X large has 128 nodes in your virtual warehouses. I'm talking about nodes, so each node is a separate server in MPP. So you can go for a one node to 128 node virtual warehouse, but that's not it. You can have up to 10 multi clusters, which means that you can your virtual warehouse can have 10 of any of these. Like you can select large uh, data, uh, large uh, virtual warehouse, and you can have 10 of large warehouses in one. Uh, 10 of uh, 18 nodes, sorry, 80 nodes in one uh, virtual warehouses. So which means that you can multiply any of these in 10 and can get that number of nodes in your one virtual warehouses. And it's auto suspense and auto resumes, which means that you will only get costed for the time you will run your query. It's the auto suspension mechanism is very very effective so you will see it like instantly so if you see the uh, synapse or the as you see called data warehouse you need to pause you need to post the servers you need to uh, start the servers you have to do it manually and even if you start it it takes certain time to start using it but in snowflakes you can instantly pause, uh, resume it you, and you even you don't have to do that. When you run the query, Snowflake automatically handle the resumes. It automatically resume your servers and give you the result. And again, you can scale up and you can scale out. So scale up means that you can add a different, you can select a different virtual warehouse or you can go for the more nodes inside your virtual warehouse. So you have that flexibility in virtual warehouses. Well, Let's talk about what makes Snowflake special. Snowflake is actually a data warehouse as a service. So why I say is that you pretty much don't have to do anything. You just push your data to the Snowflake and you start using it. You start writing queries. You start doing analysis. You don't have to worry about how the data is stored, how the security is done, and how the uh, compression and everything is done, especially how the optimization is done. Pretty much everything is handled by the Snowflake. Cloud platform agnostic, so which means that if you are already in any of these cloud, major cloud vendors, you can start use Snowflakes because Snowflakes is integrated with this. And so you are security, for example, if you're in the Azure, so you are Snowflakes is integrated with Azure Active Directory. So you can use your normal actual active directory to handle these snowflakes. No maintenance, no optimizations, auto pauses and auto resumes, which we talk. Time traveling. So you can get the time traveling feature, which will I talk in the uh, another slide separately. Automated, automated continuous data loading, snow pipe. So snow pipe is another cool thing, which means that if you push the data to the uh, sorry blobs storage snowflake identify that okay data is available in the blob storage in the location in a particular location it will automatically get that data and put into your uh, snowflake database i will explain how that happens and secure data sharing and zero copy data sharing so data cloning is you will actually not make a copy of your data when you want to share. The sharing is pretty easy and instant data sharing. You can share your data with anyone instantly and without making a copy and it's very secure. Uh, guys, now that I can't see any of you, guys are following my session. Just want a little feedback from someone. Uh, still here. We're following. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry guys, because I couldn't pretty much can't yeah. see anyone in my uh, session. <laughs> yep, cool. So let's talk about data loading. Now, when it's come to loading data, that is one thing that I will 
cover in my demo as well. We have a couple of ways to load the data to the uh, Snowflake. So you can load bulk loading, which means that you can use copy into table statement, which you put the data into staging. I talked about the, what is staging. You have both internal and external tables, and what you do is like you put your data into ex internal or external stagings, and then you execute a copy into statement, which will bring the data from staging to the Snowflake. So bulk loading supports delimited tags, JSONs, Avro, ORC, Parquet, or XML data formats. So you can use any of this text data formats, and you can push the data to the Snowflake. The next one is Snowpipe. It's automated or trigger based data loading. We'll talk it later. And you can use Snowflake's web interface to do data uploading as well. And there are a heap of third party ETL tools which facilitates to push data, work with the Snowflakes. Like uh, I'll show you what are the available uh, tools when we talked about the third party tools. So, bulk loading, how does it happen? Is like Within the Snowflakes, they give you a staging environment. So it's, there are a couple of different staging in uh, internal staging. One is uh, user based internal staging, which means that each user will get his own space within the Snowflakes where he can push his data files and that file can push data to multiple tables, but can only be used by one user so that's called user stage that's what i show in here and then you have internal name stage which means that you have a name stage think stage as a like a storage area within the snowflakes so you don't have to have your own blob storage to push the data snowflakes will give you a blob storage internal blob storage you have to push your data files there and then Snowflake will read from there. So that's what staging is basically. So in here, internal name stage means that you will give another space where you people can sh share their data. The, all the users within the Snowflake can access that internal stage and you can use that internal stage to push data to multiple tables. Or you have uh, each table has his own internal staging area, which means that data for the that particular table can be accessed from that internal table, the internal staging, and that st internal staging can be accessed by multiple users, but table internal st staging can only be accessed by that particular table. So hopefully you can understand the different staging, internal staging, one is for the user, so each user get a space and one for the table. So each table get a space and you can combine both and you can get a specific area. Each user and table push their data to the uh, Snowflakes. That's the internal staging. And that's called external staging, which means that if you have your own storage environment, blob containers, you can push data to that container and then Snowflakes can read from that container. So internal staging, external staging. Staging is nothing but a place where you put your data files so that Snowflakes can read, right? Next is Snowpipe. So Snowpipe is automated data ingestion. So which means that you push your data to the Snow, uh, blob storage and then Snow Snowflake is looking at your blob storage and whenever a file is available, it will pick and load automatically to the Snowflake's database. So which means that you don't have to ingest it. You just put the data in a particular location and Snowflake is looking at your location. Okay, is there a table is available? Is there a data is available? And then when data is available, it just automatically bring it to your uh, data warehouse, right? So there are, so let me explain how it works. So let's say you have uh, external Azure storage. So you continuously push your data to the blob storage and then you configure the event grid. So when the data is available in the blob storage, event grid makes uh, ingestion queue. 
sends Snowflake is looking at that queue, and when there's a new queue message is generated for a new file, it will bring that new file into the Snowflake. That's and it will use its own computation powers when you copy the data and you will bill for that computations. So which means that you don't have to create spin up or you don't have to resume your data warehouse, virtual warehouse, because Snowflake is using his own computation power to just to copy the data. That's, that's pretty handy when you do the ETL operations. And not only is automated, if you want, you can use REST API to trigger it when there's a requirement. If you say that, okay, automatic is not, is not something you want, you can say that, okay, I want to trigger the snow pipe so that instantly it will load the data from blob storage to the Snowflake. Cool. So I was saying, continuously pushing the data and it goes to the internal blob storage and then it goes to the injection queue and is where it's the data. The third option I talked about is use the data injection tools like pretty much all the major vendors now support Snowflake starting from ADF, it could be uh, IBM Data Stage, Talents, Wearscape, SAP, Informatica, all those big people now support data injections to the Snowflake. So if you use any of these tools, you can use these tools, especially the Metalian is really good with the Snowflake. You can use uh, these tools to put data or process data, do the ETL operations within the uh, Snowflake. Uh, this is something that I want to talk about, which just to get an idea how data is stored in the Snowflake, how they give you the performance that they are giving to your data. So there's something called micro partitioning and clustering. So when you have a large table in your fact table or with you in the Snowflake, what it does is actually it break that table into small pieces, which each piece is called micro partition. So it, let's get this example, like you have a table, a small table, like we have a large, I'll say we have a large table, which has two columns, C1 and C2. And what Snowflake does is break this column into small pieces, like micro partition one, micro partition two, micro partition six. So when it's come number of micro partitions, it can be millions of micro, micro partitions based on your, how much data you have tables. But in this case, I want to show how, you know, it works. So in my case, I only have three micro-partitions in this table, but in actually, remember, based on your data, Snowflake could break your table into millions of pieces. All right, and then let's see if you will put a bare statement saying that, okay, you want to select column one is equal to two. So when you want to select column one is equal to two, you need Snowflake has to scan micro partition one, micro partition two, micro partition three, because all of those three micro partitions has a column one is equal to two. This one has this one, this row, this one has second, first row, and this one has the third row. So what my uh, Snowflake does is, after it creates the micro partition, it actually clustering. So what clustering means that you can manually cluster as well, which is not required at all in most cases. But if you see any performance issues, this is the only thing you can do. You can cluster your large fact table. So you can cluster by C1 and C2, which basically what it does is it actually sort your tables. Now what happens is in micro partition one only have record from one, one and two and micro partition two have two, two, and four, micro partition three, four, five, six, eight. Now, when you put the select statement, it only have to scan micro partition one and micro partition two. So in most cases, like it will be, it will not scan a lot of micro partition if you do the clustering, which improves the performance. But again, I need to emphasize is you will not have to do that because this is uh, handled internally. But if if by if if something goes like if you want to improve the performance, this is the only thing you can do from the Snowflakes to improve the performance because there's no indexing or anything in the Snowflakes. This is the only thing you can do to improve the performance. Collaborations. Now this is something very cool, which means that let's say that you have your Snowflakes data warehouse, 
and you want to share your data with external vendors. So that's something we see in any most of the organizations. You have your data warehouse and your third party vendors will ask, OK, I need a portion of your data to do the analysis. This is our data. So you want to save, share the data. The problem is like you can't share the data to external people is because they are not the security is the one concern and they are not part of your organizations. You you can't add them to the Active Directory and then you can't give your data dump. That's a problem. But in the Snowflakes, you basically can share your data with anyone. They might have a Snowflakes. They might not have a Snowflakes. So, give the first scenario like this consumer is actually consuming data from multiple providers, but he is he don't have his own Snowflakes instance. So, what happens is like it, then when he consumes the data, the the, the when he run the query against your data, you will get costed for the computation power if he don't have it or he can have his own Snowflakes instance and then he will be you can share your data to his instance and then he will be get costed for his uh, Snowflakes billing and he can be either he can be a both consumer as well as he can be a provider as well. So do you have that flexibility? And then most importantly, this collaboration, the sharing is zero copy cloning, which means that Snowflakes will not make a copy of your data when it, you want to share it. So it's instant and you have one single copy. So which means that it actually handles the reference to your data internally very effectively when you want to share the data. You can set the security. All those things can be done but against one data copy. So Snowflake is not copying data here and there when you do the sharing. You have one data and it just handles the metadata layer of how you share the data. Cool. So that's the next important thing is time traveling. So when you want to push the data, by default, Snowflake give you one to 90 days uh, is depending on your actually it's depending on your uh, pricing level as well, but you can go for up to 90 days time traveling, which means that if you delete the data, if you update the data, if you basically drop your tables, you can always go up to 90 days and recover your data. And if you want, if you've done some delete, if you do update, you can check what happens 90 days. That's very cool feature when it's come to data warehousing. You have the time traveling. You can always query your historical data because it actually does not delete your data at that time. It just do your metadata operations. But after uh, 90 days, you have another seven days for the fail safe, which means that you cannot actually write query against fail safe data, right? So let's go for the example of time traveling, which means that you can set the time saying that select from the fact online sales at, at this time. At this time, how my fact table was. This is this it could be different right now. There could be a heap of insert and update, but I can go back and say that at this time, this were the data in my fact online sales. And fail safety is something that I again discuss, which means that you cannot run the query, but you if you want to contact the Snowflakes, you can get the data from your uh, deleted or the uh, deleted data basically from the fail safe after seven days. Security wise, so the security wise, you can have a network level security, IP whitelist, backlist, private link, all those things are available. The security is the main theme for the Snowflakes. You have a high level securities, multi-factor authenticators, OAuth, single sign-ons, and if you want to go to object level security, you can define virtual warehouse level security. You can uh, define the database level, user level, schema level, table level, even the column uh, dynamic against the column level security. And data security, you have automatic data encryptions, periodic key reeking, uh, breaking the customer managed keys, dynamic masking, all those things are available in the security. So the data is the security, the main concerns, main point that Snowflake is really working on because it's your data warehousing. The more the asset of your organization is your data, so you have all the security options available in this Snowflake. Well, 
Let's go to things you want to consider when it's come to the snowflakes. First, you are coming from the SQL background. No, you don't have uh, indexes. No, you cannot maintain your partitioning, which is a good thing for me, right? And no, you cannot manually distribute. If you're coming from the Synapse or the Azure SQL Data Warehouse distribute, uh, platform, you will know that you have to select what's your distribution key. You need to select whether it's a uh, hashing. You need to select whether it is uh, uh, round robins. Likewise, when you select the table, the data, create the table, you need to define what is your distribution uh, mechanism or you need to select what is your uh, hashing key, all those things in a hassle in, in a problematic area uh -huh. when it's come to uh, selecting your hash key and everything. But in this case, you pretty much don't do anything. You just dump your data and Snowflakes handle all the stuff because you don't have the distributions handling that manner. And the problem is JavaScript based all procedures. Snowflakes still does not support you to write SQL based stored procedures, but when you say JavaScript based, which means that you can write your stored procedure in SQL, but you need to embed it into a JavaScript based stored procedure and run it. Uh, not a big problem, but not a big fan as well, in a way. And stored procedure cannot return a data set, something you have to think about because when you create a stored procedure, it will not write, a, it will not select output. It will not give you output when you execute a stored procedure. What basically it does is like you need to write something when you ask the output of the stored procedure. That's something you have to do. And you cannot get a backup of your data warehouse manually. Right? So if you go for the Azure SQL DB, you can get your backup. But in here, like I'm not sure about whether you can get it through the external storage. I'm not sure. I can't remember that. But in pretty much in this case, like you can't back up your data warehouse into external storage. One other thing is like privilege does not get combined across all, which means that just remember that let's say you have two roles applicable. Let's say that you are a sysadmin or maybe you have a role A and role B, but at a given time it has effects only one role. So if you want to run a query against another one, you have to specify, OK, I'm using this role now to execute this query. It will not combine those uh, roles when you execute in the query. You have to specify what role I'm using to execute a query, even if you are part of both roles, it will not combine within the Snowflakes. Cool. Well, interesting part, the demo time. Uh, guys, how much time do I have left? I'm pretty lost in time. I think you have uh, a, li a little under 15 minutes. Oh, OK, <clears throat> well, I have to might quickly go. So what I'm going to do is like, OK, important things, guys. Whoever want to start using Snowflakes, start using now. You just need an email address. They will give you a $400 worth and 30 days trial period. And if you still want to use it, just find another email address and they will give you another 300 uh, days, $400 uh, dollars worth credit. So it will not ask you a question, just give your email address and they will each time they will give you as far as you have a valid email address, they give you $400. So you can you start using now, right? And it will have the sample data you want to play. You can start playing over there. Uh, yep. So what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to create a data warehouse. I'm checking whether I can zoom in. How does it look now? This looks OK. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can read the. Yes, yeah, yeah, cool. So I'm the Snowflakes. So if you go over the login to Snowflakes directly, so you will see I'll go back here. So you up here, you will see databases, available databases, available shares, and there's something called data marketplace and the warehouses worksheets history. I do not have time to pretty much walk through everything and then right hand side like manage object explorer. You will see your databases. So what I'm going to do is like I'm going to open a worksheet which is already I have created for because it's bad practice, bad idea to write a live live demo query. So I have written the code. What I do is like I'm going to create a database called pass SG demo. So just like a normal SQL statement, just create the tables is instantly create a database here. It will have two schemas, 
by default when you create a table. And then like a data warehouse, anyway, I'm going to use the use statement to use this database from my demo now. And here you will see that now this is my warehouse and this is not still started. Right, because you can see there's gray area because this virtual warehouse is not started, but I can still create my schemas. It's pretty cool, right? Because you can't do it in the uh, as a SQL data warehouse because you need to up your servers to do that. But now you don't have to up your servers. Your server is still offline. Your virtual warehouse is still offline, but you can create the uh, schemas within the Snowflakes. Then I'm going to create a schema, right? Still is not up. I'm going to create another schema for the fact. And let's refresh it. You have a team schema, fact schema. I, I have still not resumed my data warehouse, uh, virtual warehouse. So I'm not getting costed still for the my schema operation. Well, let's create a dimensions. So just normal team product dimensions, create statement. You can create or replace tables. Just execute this one. Still not started, but I have a table now. Let's quickly go to the another dimension called customers. I'm going to run this one. Not started. Going to use a fact table. All right. Let's create a fact table. Now I have three tables. Team, I have two dimensions. Customer and product, I have one fact online sales. I still have not used my virtual warehouse. Next thing, I'm going to upload the data and my data format will be delimited text. So I'm going to create something called file format and I'm giving you a name called CSV file format. The data type is CSV, delimited as commas, first row is header and my this is the data format inside my data file. Quickly create another one called file format called CSV file. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm going to do is like I'm going to first approach. I'm going to upload my dimension file product dimension files to my table. So how do I do that? Let's go to the database. Um, why I can't. Oh, oh, oh. So let's refresh this one. What's the switch role? Yeah, so as I said, like even if I'm the same user in the uh, uh, both roles at a given time, it shows me uh, at this effectively one role. So I just have to change my role because I create as a system. So let's go to this table database. Let's go to the product table and I'm going to load data. So you can select your virtual warehouse. This is the virtual warehouse I'm going to use to load the data and you can upload your file from the your local disk and then go back. You can select what's the file format. So remember we created the CSV file format previously. It's automatic pickup because it's the only file format right now is CSV file format and let's quickly load. Now, now only I'm going to use my virtual warehouse. So it says that OK, all those records are loaded and let's quickly go back to my worksheet here and see. I don't get refresh. Let's run this query. You can see that now is green. It took some time to show it green, but now it's green and now my virtual warehouse is started. Imagine if it's something else like if you want to start up your virtual or your VM, if you want to start up your SQL data warehouse, it will take some time to start up, but it automatically resumes. It was not started a few seconds ago and started when I run the select state or when I upload the data. So I get the data from my product dimensions. The next thing I'm going to show how you upload data using Snow SQL. So Snow SQL is actually a command uh, utility application. So this is you have to install Snow SQL and then you can uh, uh, connect from your command line. So this is Snow SQL. This is my server name. This is my username and this is my uh, uh, role I'm going to use to log into and when I connect it will ask my password. So I'm giving my password and enter the password call. I logged into my Snowflake instance using Snow SQL. Then what I'm going to do is like I'm going to 
put use a put statement what put statement basically does is it push the data in your local storage to a internal storage internal stage remember something called internal stage so when you mark this one which means that this is the notification the internal stage if i run this one you will see that i have a data file and that data file is loaded i think i have already loaded this one let's list the files in my internal storage see so that file is uploaded and it's automatic what i have in my file is actually a uh, csv file but it automatically do the compressions and it will automatically push the data to internal storage this is the data available in my internal storage so what i'm going to do is like now data is available in the internal storage i'm going to use internal storage to copy the data into the deep dimension table so the internal storage and customer csv file format is csv format this is secure this one and then all the data is recorded loaded into customer so i loaded product dimensions well i loaded the customer dimension as well next thing what i'm going to use is actually i'm going to use my own blob storage the first two is actually i use the internal storage now i'm going to use my own storage so what i could do is like i have a blob container called contour so did dw inside my asanka storage in my azure uh, blob storage and what i'm going to do is like i'm going to create the integration between snowflake and well as my snowflake so let's execute this one and integration is created and then i can check the status of my integration so once you create the integration you have to give access of you have to provide access or you have to give a present you have to tell snowflake that okay you can uh, use that uh, my microsoft account for that you have this url what you had to do is they had to copy that one and you had paste this one and enter it and then it will go to a kind of a, a page you will not see it in here but when you actually do it you will get a page where you have to ask uh, microsoft is asking whether snowflakes can access this account is it okay when you click okay then rest is done by the uh, snowflakes so i have already done that part now what i'm going to do is like i'm going to create uh, my own staging i will initially i create the integration then i'm going to create my own staging using my contours or dw uh, blob storage right then what i'm going to do is like i want to check whether my staging is working i'm going to see I'm going to write a query against my storage uh, Contoso samples customer CSV, see whether it's working, right? If I get the data, which means that, okay, my internal storage is working. Now what I'm going to do is like, let me show you how much, how my file is. So I have online sales file in my blob storage. So if you combine all these three files, we might have like pretty much over one GB files. And I'm going to load all these three CSV files to snowflakes and see i'm using a extra small virtual warehouse let's see this is very straightforward what i'm saying is so copy into my fact online sales from my intern storage control source sample is the folder name folder name and then all the files with this uh, naming conventions online sales dot star csv right then execute the statement we'll see how long does it take to load all the one gb file into snowflakes five seconds eight seconds 12 seconds 14 seconds 17 seconds okay i took 21 seconds to load one gb data which if you combine all the rows you have 12.6 million records loaded into your snowflake using extra small warehouses and then you just pretty much run the query instantly you get the data right you have uh, this millions of record four millions three millions five millions records for all the years in your fact sales table fact online sales and you want to see how the data is loaded just run this the uh, at which file what's the file is came from where the data is coming from and when it is loaded you can all get all the metadata about 
how the data is loaded to your uh, table. So you can information schema dot copy history information. You can get the all the data, how the data is copied to your fact tables. And yep, uh, the check from this one. And uh, uh, let's skip this one because I don't have a time. Well, let's go for the time traveling thing. So I'm going to just delete this uh, record, this set of records, which the full date is 2007 Jan 1st. I'm going to delete that record from the fact tables, right? Let's delete it and then see whether it's actually deleted. You will see that there shouldn't be any data because just a moment ago I deleted. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use time traveling. Let's enter. So what I'm saying is like I can select from the table how the table a minute ago, how the table was a minute ago and check with the full date table 2007 Jan 1st was available. What do you think? Previously I checked there was no data for this one, but was it there was a data a minute ago? Oh, it is. There was no data now. If you select it, the current table, but a minute to go table, this time traveling, I'm going time traveling. This is the delete data that I deleted. And not only that, now that you have deleted the records, you can make a zero copy cloning of your data. So what I'm going to do is like I'm going to create a table from a minute ago, how the table was minute ago. So I'm going to create one minute ago table and then in the minute ago table, you have the data. Right. I'm sorry, I just have to change it because minute almost pass with the what I'm writing the query. Sorry for that one. And I can drop the table, right? Oops, I dropped my table. Oh, see, no table. No, sorry, I've dropped my database actually. There's a huge mistake. Oh, no, I did not, maybe. Let's undrop the table. Oh, it's already there. So you can drop it and drop it. You can play with if something goes wrong. That is there in the snowflakes. Well, there are a lot of things I can sh how to show, but I think I don't have much time. So yeah, uh, if there's any questions, now is the time. Those last two are awesome. Yeah, <laughs> especially <laughs> when you go something wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, we yeah. actually have a few questions on the chat. Let, let me read them to you. Uh, yeah. Unless uh, unless your basso asks, uh, I, I think the, I think this one is a Databricks user. Uh, it looks very similar to features of Databricks and Delta Lake. How yes. do you see it com uh, com uh, in comparison with Snowflake in your experience? Well, um, Delta Lake is actually uh, is different to a Snowflake. The reason is, is Data Lake is not actually designed for the data warehousing. And uh, it has, yeah, it has a time traveling, all those stuff. But uh, to be honest, like from what I see, Delta Lake saves the data in files. It's not an MPP engine, I would say, because it's, it's do the processing MPP, but the, how the data handling is uh, not MPP as of the but you see the snowflakes, but uh, I cannot do fully comparison. The reason is like I have not used Data Lake as a data warehousing perspective. Yep. But yeah, that's the only answer that I can give because I cannot do a one to one comparison between these two. But no, I have not because I've seen people try to use Data Lake for this purpose and they mm -hmm. have given up and move into snowflakes. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. Yeah, they, data lake is more on st storing your files and all your information. Yeah, they're talking about the delta lake, mm -hmm. Databricks delta lake. So they Databricks. have, uh, yeah, Databricks delta lake. So they have input, they have created another layer for the same purpose. But uh, yeah, to be honest, like I have not used it, so I can't do a full fetch comparison. But uh, again, I have seen a big, big company have failed using delta lake as a data warehousing and moved mm -hmm. to Snowflake. How about uh, uh, Delta streaming? Uh, does Snowflake have something similar to Databricks Delta streaming to replace ETL when you're streaming in transformation pipelines? So that, remember I, sh I showed about the uh, Snowpipe? Yep. So they pitched that as uh, their streaming solution, but okay. 
but uh, there's a bit of a delay when you get the uh, message queue and data breaks is getting the data using the message queue. So it's not a real time streaming solution, but mm. it's, but yeah, it's kind of a streaming, but not no, no, you don't have a real time streaming solution attached to Snowflake. Okay. As a ETL, but you can you can use other methods to push the data. If as far as you push in data real time, you can get the data. Yep. Okay, and then and there's another one. Uh, so the the virtual warehouse is it only compute or is it also the storage? No, it's only the compute. Only the compute. You'll be costed. You'll be costed for the storage separately. And you will be get costed for the query time using your virtual warehouse. So the size of the virtual warehouse, as well as how long you run the query, is the one decide the uh, you know the pricing for the uh, computations. Storage is separate and it's cheap. Ah, there's a follow up one. So when you're ingesting the CSV, you're not actually ingesting them. I'm actually ingesting the dem. I actually okay. ingesting the data. So what I do is like I initially ingest push the data into a intermediate state place which is i call staging so if you don't have your own staging or if you, if you don't have your own blob storage snowflakes gives you a storage to put your files and then snowflakes is reading that file and storing to the uh, database okay I, I actually have a question for that one uh yeah. so does that mean snowflake cannot process in place. It needs to stage the data to Snowflake itself. It can, for example, it, it, it has to, yeah, like you said, it, it has to ingest the data from from your sources, for example, from the CSP. It needs to transfer it to Snowflake before it can process it. It can't process it in place. Is that correct? Uh, when you say process, I, I didn't get it. What do you mean by process? For example, if does it need to transfer your data from, for example, if you're using a blob storage so you're copying the data from that blob storage transferring it to your snowflake in internal storage to, for it to process is that correct or it, it's just a, it's just a matter of you put how you put the data actually so if you mm -hmm. use let's say data factory mm -hmm. you just get the data from one source and you push the data to the uh, other source with the snowflakes so if you don't use any etl tools you these are the by default options given by snowflakes Remember, so, but mm -hmm. if you use talent, Informatica, there's no such thing. You source system is here. You set this connector. Your destiny is Snowflakes. You push the data. Did, mm -hmm. did I answer your questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So because these so, methods so I showed I is a default default method without mm -hmm. using any ingestion tools. Because Snowflakes need to connect to somewhere to get the data. Yeah, and it, basically Snowflake uses you have a JDBC, ODBC, all those connectors, so you can use them as well if you want to. OK, yeah. Uh, all right, uh, there's another one from uh, Hemant. Can you join a local on-premise database uh, table with one in the Snowflake on the cloud? No, no, you cannot. When you say joining, you say like you writing cross join to the databases and run a query when you say joining. If that is means no, I think it's not possible for any of the uh, tools because these are two different uh, uh, instances. For example, like you cannot join a SQL Server in your on-premise with Azure SQL Service. But in Azure, you cannot actually join two SQL databases, even same server. If that's what you mean. Oh, OK, I think that's what he means. If, if yeah. for example, he has a data on premise, he wants to join the information on what you have in Snowflake. There's no yeah, way you right? had to push. Yeah, you had to push you the data. To push to the the data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, OK, uh, any other questions, guys, uh, folks? Before we let Asanka go. Uh, going once. All right, I think that's all. Uh, so thank you, Asanka, for for this very informative session. 
do you have any closing slides or are you um, no no so pretty much it like <laughs> uh, i have only quite question five with those questions yeah all That's right pretty much mentioned. and yeah so one last thing i want to say is like remember guys is free for 30 days 400 dollars you just only need the email address start using now and play around it in and you yeah, just to at least to learn how it works and you know just play around it yep yeah oh. All right, uh, so uh, folks, uh, I dropped the evaluation link on on the chat. So if uh, kindly send your evaluation for uh, for this session. If you have any other questions that you would like to ask, you can uh, course it through the evaluation. I'll, I can pass it through, pass it to Asanka. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Asanka. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, so...